And good morning, everybody. Morning to those online watching. And uh, so I heard uh, a lot of good answers to prayers. See, uh, Faye's doing better. Aiden's healing up. Uh, Francis doing better. I mean, just uh, answer to prayers. It's really neat when you you pray about people during the week, and then a week or two later, you come to church on Sunday and find out that hey, things are good. Things are really looking good. So uh, we have a great God that that just loves to love us and and take care of us. And I was watching. Uh, we were out of town camping last week. I watched a little bit of the church online. And, uh, Jeff Diddley said that uh, took him out fishing, but he didn't give any bait to him. But actually, I gave him a cracked bobber, so every once in a while it would sink. <laughs> it looked like he got a bite, so it wasn't that bad. Anyway, VBS team, are you going to lead a song? Hello. So we had Backyard VBS um, last week, and we had a lot of fun. Um, the theme was um, hidden things, and we read a bunch of different parables. So all the kids learned about what a parable is, and that is a story with a hidden meaning. Yes, we had lots of fun. We had lots of different games. We had snacks that went with the parable of the day. Um, the kids were really excited about all of the games that we got to play, and um, we got to sing songs. So today, we are going to sing a song for you guys, and the kids are all going to do different motions. So some kids at a different house had different motions than the ones at another house. So we're going to get to see the different motions that everybody learned Desire only 
Jesus satisfies God is good and he's good to me he's all I want and he's all I need so I couple of years that's because of COVID I used to do uh, games all the time and I just enjoyed VBS so much and Kate was lucky she got to go around and see them all and take pictures at the, the houses but well, there's uh, people that offer their houses and uh, the time and energy uh, they're just a blessing to us because you can see that they're putting the love of the Lord into these little children that we have here and uh, they can just sing a song and have a, a fun enjoying the, what they're hearing about God VBS is just a, a real blessing for kids, and it, and I know uh, because of COVID, it just shut things down. I mean, I remember we had like 150 kids out here on, for VBS. So uh, praise the Lord again for and thank you all that uh, were participating in VBS for the kids of the community here. And uh, what else do I got here? Ken Smith passed away. That's uh. Ken Smith, anyway, uh, his wife was up here in the front, Maria. He passed away at the end of last year. Ken's wife, Maria Gassett, would like to invite the church family to Ken's memorial service at her home on Saturday, July 23rd at 2 p.m. Maria's address is listed in the printed bulletin. Please come and support her. I guess uh, offering, have the offering now. And say, can't think of anything else to say. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's Chris Boswell. They're going to have uh, something to say about the uh, crisis response team? Huh? Oh, sorry about that. Ushers, stand at ease. Stand. <laughs> All right. Good morning. I'm Chris Bosvelt, and I am here to tell you a little bit about uh, a mission trip that we have planned for September. Um, if you uh, don't know my son Ellis, um, as I think most of you do, he ended up going to South Carolina, or excuse me, North Carolina, Moorhead, Moorhead City, uh, with a trip that this church sponsored down there. And when he was down there, 
he loved what he was doing and he heard God calling him to mission work and that is what you sponsor him to do down there and he loves what he does. But I talked to him the other day, he says, hey mom, we've got two weeks open in September, see if anybody wants to come down and help out. So um, uh, my tool, my favorite tool, or uh, yeah, it is my favorite tool actually. I do a lot of trim work when I'm down there um, and so uh, there's other opportunities to uh, just clean up, just um, sheet rocking, uh, you know, just many, many things to do. So the talent level isn't anything that's a requirement to be very high. Uh, just if you have a good gift of gab, that's even important because we do uh, love to talk to the, the people there, the, the homeowners, uh, the neighborhood, um, just tell them about the grace of God and the goodness. Um, so anyways, September, the two weeks that we could go are September 4th, that week, or the 18th. Um, if that works for you, it's, um, again, just a matter of uh, going and wanting to serve. So I'll be in the back if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to chat with me. I'd love that. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. I don't know if I've ever gone on a mission trip, but uh, it's really a blessing. So, uh, and you get to hang with the people that you go down with, get to know them a little better, uh, meet a lot of people you don't know, that uh, it just be a blessing and a chance for you to be feet and take that message of the gospel out to other people. Uh, Father, we thank you again for, for blessing us so abundantly in this community. We thank you for your love for us that uh, is continuous and never ending and, and just uh, lifting us up. We offer our tithes and offerings back to you, Father, for your glory, that they be used to let people know about Jesus. And Father, again, we lift up Ellis, uh, out doing the work uh, of, our, of our community, serving the Lord uh, with his feet and his hands. And we thank you again, Father, for all the blessing that he brings to our community. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, it's been a good morning so far, hasn't it? Yeah, it has been. Uh, in between the services, just so that you know this, there is a prayer time over on this side over here. So if there's any times that you have something that you would just like someone to pray with you, um, that is a great time to approach um, the people that are there and just say, I have a need, would you pray with me? And so that happens in between the services over here on this side. I have a few announcements this morning. I thank you for all the people um, who have met with me so far. I've done about 38 interviews, and uh, all of those have been really precious as I hear about your church, and also I get to know you a lot better. Um, I'm thankful for that. We are going through 1 Peter, and we handed out these scripture journals, but if you didn't get one and you would like one, raise your hand, because an usher will bring one for you right up to you. There's one up here, um, and there's one over on this side, also over here, and there's some more in the, bo in the box in the back, too, back there. Thanks, guys. Um, and also, we, I, I keep trying to uh, do a sermon outline, so those are back on the back table. This is everything that's usually up on the screen, so that you don't have to feel like that you have to... Uh, to fill it all out or write all that down. So if you want one of those, see, I got the ushers moving like crazy right now. Just raise your hand. They'll bring you one of those sheets. They're on the back table there, and they're in the back table there on the counter back there. Just keep your hand up. They'll get it to you. Um, I've titled this sermon, The Whereas and the Therefores. The Whereas and the Therefores. Now, if you've been in the legal world, um, you know what that is. It, you'll have a resolution and he'll say, whereas such and such, whereas such and such, whereas such and such, whereas such and such. Then he'll say, therefore. And the whereas are all the facts, the supporting facts. And then once you get to the bottom, then you say, therefore, this is the action that we are going to do. Probably a very famous one of those was when uh, George Washington uh, did the first proclamation of thanksgiving. He says, whereas, 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 therefore, we are going to set a day aside for the day of thanksgiving. Well, that's what I see in this passage of scripture that we've went through so far up to verse 12, is Peter has been giving us the whereas, the facts about salvation, 
And if you look at verse 13, it says, therefore. So now the action is going to come into play. And the action, I find four important commands that he's going to tell them. He's done all the whereas. Now he's going to give them four important commands. And, and remember, he's speaking to first century Christians, Gentile Christians, who are being heavily persecuted. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we go through these four commands that are there. Um, here's another Trinity song. Last week we sang the doxology, and I, because one of the things that Peter is doing in his thesis statement, he wants you to know about the Trinity, and you'll see this through this whole letter. Keep marking in there every time you see the, one of the names of the, of the Godhead. The second thing he wants them to know about is their salvation and how precious it is about their salvation, that they need to lean on their salvation. And then the third one is, is how to reside in this hostile world. He's going to give us some practical um, application of how do we live in a world that is very hostile to Christianity, because that's who he's writing to at this time. Okay, but here's another one. We'll just sing the first verse. Are you ready? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. There you go. Boy, I'm going to get a choir here pretty soon. Um, if you notice, one of the songs we sang was also another song that had the Trinity in it. So what I did was I just strung all these whereas together in verse 12, as if Peter had written it this way. Maybe he would have said, whereas our salvation is influenced by all of the Trinity, whereas our salvation is based on a living hope because Jesus rose from the dead, whereas our salvation includes an imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven inheritance, whereas our salvation is protected by God's power, whereas our salvation is more precious than gold, whereas our salvation will not perish, Whereas our salvation results in the praise, glory, and honor at the second coming of Christ, whereas our salvation was prophesied by the prophets, whereas our salvation was proclaimed by the apostles, whereas our salvation gets the attention of the angels, therefore, and that's where we are. So if you have your scripture journals, we're in verse 13, and I want to show you these four different commands that are there. So verse 13 says this, and you'll see it says, therefore, that's the very first word, preparing your minds. Now, if you like to write in these, I would circle the word minds because he's going to keep going back to talking about what you know. And you're going to see how many times he refers to your mind. But he says, preparing your minds for action and being sober minded. There it is again, minded. Here's the first one. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the first command. Actually, you could read this, therefore, set your hope. You could jump right to that one. Now, I want you to keep your finger in Ephesians because Paul also uses this type of language talking about our hope. What he wants us to do, what he wants them to do, is to set their hope fully on the grace, fully on the grace. What is the grace? The grace is Jesus, that God sent his son. The grace is that we have eternal life because of salvation, because Christ died on the cross, and that he, that one who died on the cross and buried in the grave and ascended into heaven is coming again. Amen. And so you have to set your hope fully on that, fully on that. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10 Paul says it this way, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show us incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace 
you've been saved through faith. And this is not for of yourselves. Say, uh-uh. Uh-uh. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are created in God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works. We're created in Christ Jesus. That's the first part, to do good works. And you always have to keep that in order. Never put the good works before the created, okay? That's when we get in trouble. When we think in any way, shape, or form that what we do would get us to heaven, that's wrong. That is absolutely unbiblical thinking. We always have to realize that our salvation, our salvation comes from God alone, and that that salvation produces something. That salvation results in his children, his children doing good works, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance. There it is again, that predetermined plan of God. He prepared in advance for us to do. So how do I set my hope fully on the grace of the second coming of Jesus Christ? How do I do that? Well, he, he tells us how. Preparing your minds for action. Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. He says it starts up here. This is where it starts. It starts up in your head, and, and the, some versions will say, gird up. Now, the picture there, the word picture there is they had robes. And if they were going to run, or if they were going to be in battle or anything like that, <clears throat> they would take the end of their robes, and they would pull them up and put them underneath whatever belt or sash they had, which exposed their legs, but it allowed them to run. It allowed them to move more freely. If they left the robes down, they could trip and fall. And so you girded up that, and you were ready for action. He's saying, do that with your mind. Do that with your mind. Gird up your mind for action. You need to start thinking energetically about your salvation, about him coming again. You have to think energetic. Don't put it in the back portion of your mind. Put it in the front portion of your mind. And then he says, being sober-minded. Don't be drunk-minded about this. Be clear-minded about this. So if I'm going to set my hope fully on the second coming of Jesus Christ, the grace that has been given to me that will be revealed in its ultimate state at the second coming of Jesus Christ, I've got to engage my mind about that, and I need to clear, think clearly about that. Um, 1 Peter 3.15, I'll let you read that sometime, but it says, you know, make, make sure that you have a defense for the hope that is within you. And many times people will think like, like, oh, I need to know every apologetic argument. No, you don't need to know every apologetic argument, although if you do know them, it's really great. But it's really having a clear mind that I am one of his children. And that's what you share with others. You share with them a genuine faith with them that they see that you, you know, you say with Isaac Newton, you say with, um, with um, I was blind, but now I see. That, I, I can't answer all your questions, but I can answer this one. I was blind, but now I see. You let them see that genuine faith, that hope of him coming again. Um, Colossians, let's go there. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, verses 2 through 4, Paul says these terminology again, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, a couple weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, I talked about how uh, one of the tenets of the faith is that w we believe as Christians that Jesus rose from the dead. You can't say, I'm a Christian, but I just don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. You can't do that because the Bible says if you're a Christian, you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. His rising from the dead verified everything he said and everything he had ever done, okay? But on top of that, on top of that, you are also saying that you believe that you will also rise from the dead. That because he rose from the dead, I am going to be resurrected. 
one day. And I will be with him in that final day. So let's look at commandment number two. So that was commandment number one. Commandment number two, starting in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Now that word there you could circle again because that's dealing with your mind, ignorance. But as he called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. That's number two. That's commandment number two. Be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, and he takes you back to the Old Testament, you shall be holy for I am holy. Be holy in all your conduct. If you still got your finger in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, it says he's going to show you that there's been a change in you. Ephesians 4, 22, you were taught with regard to the former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God, like God in true righteousness and, guess what? Holiness, holiness. We are to be holy because our God is holy. That is why we are holy people. It is not because of ourselves, It's because we are following a holy God, a holy God. How do we do that? And I put up there where Leviticus 11, 14, and 45, that's where he gets that. I am holy, be holy, for I am holy. And all through Leviticus, you'll have those references there where he will say that over and over again. But how do we do it? Well, as obedient children. Or you could flip that phrase around and say, children of the obedient. Since we are children of the obedient. Now, the disobedient is Satan. He's the disobedient. We are no longer children of the disobedient. We are now children of the obedient. The one who is obedient even unto death. That's who we are children of. As that, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So there is going to be a change here. I need to submit to my father. I need to submit to him because I am one of his children. And I need to allow what I know in, with my mind, which is engaged and clear, to be now God-shaped. So before, I was conformed to the passions of my former ignorance. Now I need to be conformed to the passion of my present knowledge of who I am in Christ, who I am in Christ, and therefore I follow after him. Um, The passage in Matthew chapter 5, that's uh, Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, you know, you once heard it said, um, love, you know, you don't have to love your enemies. But he says, but I say to you, love your enemies. And And he points out that there's a huge change that has happened, and you are doing this because you're following after him. This Ephesians 1, if you're still there, I want to read this one. Paul says it this way. Be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, there we go again, children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering to the sacrifice of God. So, we are to be holy because he is holy. That is the whole reason why. It's to be holy because he is holy. Let's go to the third one, verses 17 through 19 in your passage. And it says, And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear. That's the third one. If you're putting numbers by these, that's number three. Conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing, okay, there you go, circle the word knowing because it's engaging your mind again, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, he's making a comparison here, but with the precious blood of Christ. So if silver and gold are perishable, the precious blood of Christ is what? imperishable, imperishable, like a lamb without blemish or spot. That blood of Christ, again, that's the second time he said that now. He said that back in in verse 2. 
he, he made reference to that about the sprinkling of his blood. So, third command, conduct yourselves with fear. Now, in the Bible, fear is used a couple different ways, and so you really have to look at the context of the passage to understand what fear is he talking about here. Same word, it, and we get the word phobia from it. Um, so when there is a time in the Bible when it says fear, where it is, ah, you know, yeah, like, ah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, kind of thing. That it, there's times like that, but then there are other times in the Bible when fear is more in the context of reverence a deep honor. And I put down there a reverence with action. It's a reverence that leads to some type of response from you to whatever you are focused in on, okay? So how do we do this? He says, if you call on him as father, if you call on him as father, then you are admitting that you are his what? Child, child of the obedient, obedient children, but you're, what are you this passage say about the father, you are acknowledging that he is the just judge. You are the one, who, you're saying he is the one who is going to make everything right. He is the one that's going to settle all accounts. He is the one who is sovereign over everything. And it looks really messed up down here now. But in the end, this one, this God, my father, is going, it's going to be all righted by him because he is the just judge. Okay, if you hold him as that, then on the other side of that, you remember that you've been ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. You remember that, wait a minute, the only reason I have salvation is because Jesus died on the cross. The only reason I have that is because of his substitutionary atonement, because he took my place. He, he took the cup of wrath of God for me. So what... Peter is trying to get you to do is both sides of the coin here. He's saying, if I'm going to conduct myself in fear, I need to keep God in that position that he is sovereign over all. And I need to continually remember what happened on that cross for me. So I need to give God his place and position. And I need to engage my mind again, because it says knowing, knowing how you were ransomed, engage my mind again of my place and position and how I was pardoned, how I was pardoned. If we keep those two things in place, we will conduct ourselves with fear. We will conduct ourselves with a reverence of who God is and who Jesus is, and it'll be a reverence that will have action to it. There'll be some type of um, emotion grabbed there. So I hope you start to see that, that what's happening here is you're knowing a lot of stuff, right? You're knowing a lot of stuff, but where's the emotion come? It comes from down here in your heart. I put down there Isaiah 53, 7. If you want to read that, that's the suffering servant chapter. And, and Isaiah uses the same terminology of, of him being led like a lamb before the slaughter, that passage. And, and the allusion here is to that Passover lamb when they would celebrate Passover. They would bring in a lamb. It was supposed to be without spot or blemish. They would bring it into their home, and they would, uh, they would test it and watch over it for four days. But then that lamb was slaughtered, and the blood was put on the doorposts of, of there. And, it's, and, and, and it, the illusion is that that lamb is like Jesus Christ. Now, always keep it that way. The Passover lamb is like Jesus, not the other way around. Jesus is the real thing. Jesus is the one without spot or blemish. That Passover lamb that they looked at for years upon years upon years was just a picture of the one who was going to come, who was the real thing. Like Coca-Cola, right? Coca-Cola is the real thing. Okay. I am to be deeply reverent because God is my father, and Jesus shed his very blood to ransom me. Don't diminish or dismiss these facts. Don't downplay these facts in any way, shape, or form. Always keep God high and lifted up. Always keep Jesus in that precious place that he died on the cross for, my, for me. Keep those in place and you will conduct yourselves with fear, a reverent fear. Now, 
Uh, verse 20 and 21, <clears throat> he just tells us a little more again about Jesus and his role in our salvation when he says, he was foreknown from the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you. So again, we, we pointed that out. Predetermined plan of God that Jesus was foreknown by God and that at a later point, at a certain point in time, he was made manifest as a man so that he would die on the cross for our sins, okay? And we looked at that saying, okay, that's the same type of language he uses about our salvation, that we were foreknown by God. And then later on, at a certain time in your time, in your time, your eyes were opened and you realized that Jesus is the Christ. And you responded to him with repentance and faith. That's there, okay? Verse 21, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead. That's the second time he says that, about that important thing about Christians. We believe Jesus was raised from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope, two things, faith and hope are in God. So again, you can go back to Acts chapter 2, 22 through 24. That's where Peter explains that whole thing out, that, wait a minute, you guys did this to Jesus but it was all his plan. It was all God's plan. God was in control. Um, some people will say that the word last times is in there. Um, are we in the last times? Yeah, we are. And you can say that confidently that we are in the last times because Jesus inaugurated the last times. The last times started when Jesus came and when he died on the cross. Now, can you say, are we in the last of the last times, Pastor Adam? Well, I think we're closer <laughs> I, th I truly do. I mean, there are things that we just, um, we would have, 20 years ago, we would have not even thought of. And now they are reality. Like, like you're going, wow. That so yes, we, we are progressing down this road. But I wanted to read you one verse, Hebrews 9, 26, that just kind of pinpoints that. When Jesus came, he inaugurated the last times. In verse 26 of chapter 9 in Hebrews, it says, then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, there we go, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. So when, when did he sacrifice himself? On the cross. And so he inaugurated in the last times. Who is who in this passage? Who is always, takes you back to verse 1, the chosen, the elect exiles. And because of what Jesus has done, I am now a believer in God. Because my eyes have been opened to see that he is my Savior, that activation makes me now a true believer in God. So someone says, oh yeah, I believe in God. Yep, I believe in God. Yeah. <laughs> they really don't believe in God unless they accept Christ as their Savior. They do not know who God is. That's the way it reads there. Who through him, through Jesus, are believers in God. How did you become a believer in God? Because you accepted Christ as your Savior. Who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. I put that down there. God raised Jesus from the dead, and from dead, that's suffering, he gave him glory, and as we read last week in verse 11, that's what the prophets were searching out. They were searching out this Messiah that would come that would suffer, but then later be brought to glory. Peter just plays it out again. He says, now your faith and hope are in God. Faith is a conviction of a truth. You have a conviction of a truth. Something is true, and you have a conviction toward it. Therefore, you have faith. That deals up here. Okay? Hope is the expectation of something, and you always have to look at the context. Is it an expectation of something good or expectation of something bad? In this situation, it's an expectation of something good because of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, but hope emits an emotion. There's always emotion wrapped up in hope that, that it brings, and if it's a good, it brings you joy in what is to come. 
So he says, now, because your eyes have been opened, because you realize that Jesus died on your cross, now you are a true believer in God, and you have faith in God. You have a conviction about him that everything about him is true. And you also have a hope. You also have your heart engaged of what is to come and that day that you will be with him. So let's go to number four. We'll finish up here. Here's commandment number four. When he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Now, let me do that again. Having purified your souls, okay, purified, past tense, by obedience to the truth. He just called us what? Obedient children. As obedient children. So by your obedience to the truth. Now, we don't know what truth is yet. He's going to tell us but we don't know at this point, you could put a question mark there, for a sincere brotherly love. So this response of obedience to whatever is true, whatever this truth is, produces a sincere brotherly love. Then here comes number four, love one another earnestly with a pure heart. Love one another earnestly with a pure heart. Since you have been born again, past tense, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So let me stop there. Fourth one, love one another earnestly, or some versions will say fervently, fervently love one another. Now, I put these two phrases up there, having purified your souls, okay, past tense, and then he says past tense again, have been born again. Those two are equal, and what the Bible does sometimes, what the writers in the Bible do is they do a sandwich, I like to call it an Oreo, okay? And you know an Oreo has that chocolate wafer, and then there's the creamy, like double stuff, woohoo, you know, in the middle. And then you have the chocolate wafer on the bottom, okay? So sometimes in the Bible it uses that technique where the chocolate layer on the top, he starts by saying, having purified your souls. Having purified your souls. And then he ends the phrase with, having been born again. That's the bottom chocolate layer. So the chocolate layers both say the same thing, and sometimes they will actually use the same very same words. And then in between is that creamy stuff, the stuff that everybody loves. And, and, and that's where he gives us the instruction about this number four. Your obedience to the truth is a response to what is established. How do you do this? How do you love someone earnestly? out of a pure heart, look at how much he focuses in on the word. He talks about this word being living and abiding word. It's not dead word, it's a live word. And it's abiding, it's within us. Then he uses the scriptures in verse 24, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of a grass. And the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word, there he goes, again, he says it, the word of the Lord remains forever. So now we got this word that is not dead, but alive, this word that is abiding, it's within you, and this word that has the quality that it will never die. It will last forever. And then he says, he finishes it with, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. And right there, you could circle good news and make an arrow all the way back up to the truth, obedience to the truth. Now we know what the truth is. The truth is the good news. What you have responded to is the gospel because this is the gospel that has been preached to you. This word, truth, is the gospel in full view. And if I'm going to love others earnestly, fervently, I need to keep God's word and and, and his gospel in view to love them that way. I need to always keep that before me when I'm in front of someone to love them that way. So let's, let's just walk. I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going boom, boom, boom. One, two, three, four. Set your hope fully on the grace. That's number one. So where's your mind been lately? See, if, if you're going to set your hope fully on the grace, the second coming of Jesus Christ, has your mind been on that lately? Where has your mind been lately? Your mind may have been on a ton of other things. 
and focused on a ton of other things. But if I'm going to set my hope fully on that, I need to move my mind onto the things of God about the salvation that I've received. Number two, be holy in all your conduct. Does what I re know relate to what I do? Does what I know about God and know about Jesus Christ, does it relate to what I do now? Am I, am I living this type of life that I'm living? I'm doing it because I'm an imitator of God, the one who sent his son so that I, that I might have salvation. Number three, conduct yourselves with fear. I put down there, who's your daddy and savior? Who's your, if I'm going to do that, I need to remember that I need to keep my God high and lifted up and I need to keep my Jesus in his rightful place of, of being the one who has risen from the grave. I need to do that so that I respond with such an awe of who he is. And the fourth one, love one another earnestly. Uh, you know, love gauge low, you got your gauges is the love gauge low? I put down there, how long has it been when you... Because if you're going to love people earnestly, and actually if you start within the household of God, it's supposed to, it, it spreads out from there, but if you start with the household of God, there are times you're going to have to say, I'm sorry. There are times you're going to say, please forgive me. There are going to be times when you're going to sit alongside of somebody and you're going to weep with them because they're weeping. Or you're going to rejoice because they're rejoicing. There, there's going to be times like that where we... If we're going to love one another earnestly, th those are some of the responses that need to come from us. I put down hug. You see my alliteration. There's hope, there's holy, there's honor, and there's hug. Now, remind you, back of our minds, remember, who's he writing to? First century Gentile Christians who are being heavily persecuted, heavily persecuted, be put on stakes, put in racks, pulled in all different directions, um, just terrible things are being done to them. So Peter says to whereas, 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 therefore, this is what I want you to do. Run for the hills. He doesn't say that to them, do, does he? He doesn't say that at all. He says to these heavily persecuted Christians, this is what I want you to do. Keep your hope set fully on the grace. That, that he is coming again and that there is a second coming of Christ and he has a prepared home for you. Number two, be holy in all your conduct. Yeah, even while they're doing that, be holy in all your conduct because the one that you follow after is holy. Yeah, conduct yourself with fear. Even in the persecution, conduct yourself with fear. Keep God high and lifted up. Keep saying, no, Jesus is Lord. Caesar isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. And number four, love one another earnestly. Oh, are you sure, Peter? You see what they're doing? He says, no, love them earnestly. Continue to love them like I love them, even in the persecution. Now, when you put that in context, you realize that, wait a minute, man, we, we have nothing like what they were going through. And these are the commands he gives them to follow. So look, let's look at our own world. Let's look at our own situation that is changing, that is changing, but these are still the same commands for us Christians to follow, to follow. Um, last verse here is Galatians 5, 6. I put it up here. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. The outside stuff doesn't mean anything. But faith, that would be the inside stuff, working through love. So there's a, what really matters is your faith, and it, is, it works out in love. NIV says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then I put this last one on here. This is the Young's literal translation. This is a really hard one to read because what he took was, he took the Greek and he kept it in the same order and then he put the English underneath it. So it's, sometimes it just sounds really odd to read it because it's not the way that we read things. But I like it because it says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith through love. So there it is again. Faith through this love. And then the emphasis is on the very last word, which is the verb, working. And I love that because, yeah, we have a faith. 
And we have a faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes out in this love, a love for him and a love for others. And it's working. The last thing, it's working. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And um, we are so thankful for your word. It's precious to us. We thank you for Jesus and his precious blood. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who, for his precious presence in our lives. And may these commands um, guide us this day. In thy precious name, amen.